Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Joseph Lam, uh, and welcome to a new Money Chat episode. Uh, I'm your I'm your host, so I'm the deputy country manager of Stashway Mina, uh, and today we're joined uh, and uh, by by three guests for the first time. We usually have only two guests uh, on on the session, and we have a quite an interesting topic to discuss today. And we're wrapping up the month of March, uh, which was quite turbulent, let's just say, in terms of the financial market with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, with the hikes of um, the inflation in the US and globally, but also we celebrated women uh, in the month of March. We celebrated the International Women's Day on March 8th. We celebrated uh, also Mother's Day here in the MENA region a couple of days ago. But actually, we don't, we don't need any kind of occasion and special day to celebrate women. We should celebrate them uh, on a daily basis. But for today's session, we're talking about financial planning and investing for women. And just a small disclaimer before getting started, we're not trying to differentiate investing and personal finance from man to woman. It's exactly the same. Uh, and we'll talk about it in, in just a bit. But this session today is more about raising awareness to uh, to filling that gap between uh, men and women. And, and we'll, we'll talk about it in, in more detail in just a, just a sec. But I, first, I want to introduce our, our guests for, for this evening. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Deborah Fur, who is the managing director and uh, founder of ETFGI. Hi, Deborah. Hi, thank you for enjoying uh, having me on the show. Thank you so much, Deborah. Would you mind introducing yourself uh, and a bit of a uh, background, maybe your cat as well, uh, <laughs> uh, to the audience? Thank you. Uh, sure. So my name is uh, Deborah Fur, and as was mentioned, I'm the founder and managing partner of ETFGI. We're an independent research and consulting firm covering the global ETF industry. We do events and we actually do a weekly TV show called ETF TV. Um, my cat behind me is Misty, and I thought the door was closed, but I heard it opening uh, a second ago, so she has decided to show up. Um, but I've been involved with the ETF industry since 1997, and so what that means is when I started at Morgan Stanley in London on the sales and trading floor, there were 21 ETFs and $8 billion invested in them. Um, we'll talk about it later, but at the end of the year, we reached $10.3 trillion dollars 20,000 uh, different listings of ETFs and 1.3 trillion of net inflows. I worked at Morgan Stanley in London for 11 years, was a managing director. And then on the day Lehman filed for bankruptcy, I joined Barclays Global Investors, which became BlackRock to create industry research. So I was a managing director there for uh, about three years before setting up my company 10 years ago. And I'm one of the founders of Women in ETFs, which is a nonprofit in the US where our goal is to connect, support, inspire women and men to come together to encourage women to enter the financial industry and to have good careers. Thanks, Deborah, for, uh, for the introduction. Um, also, uh, our second guest for, for this evening is Felicity Glover, who is the personal finance editor at The National. Hi, Felicity. Thanks a lot for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me here. Thank you. Also, would you mind also introducing yourself to, to the audience and just a bit of a background about yourself? Okay, sure. Uh, so um, I'm the personal finance editor at The National. It's actually my second stint uh, as personal finance at the, at the National. I seem to go in circles sometimes. Um, but uh, my background is, uh, you know, business, personal finance journalist. Um, and, you know, I have a huge passion uh, to help our readers understand, learn about financial literacy, investing, saving, budgeting, you know, kind of everything that comes under that personal finance banner or umbrella. Thank you, Chris. Jen, we'll get into that uh, as part of the questions later on to see uh, how you can help more readers and, and listeners, because I believe also you have a podcast uh, on, on the national that helps and, and guides people about uh, personal finances. Uh, so we get to that in a bit, but, but finally, I also want to introduce um, our very own general manager of Stashaway, Ramzi Khleb, who is a very familiar has a familiar face on, on the platform. But would you mind also introducing yourself, Ramzi, uh, to the audience? Yeah, thanks, Joseph. So yeah, so my name is Ramzi, Ramzi Khleb. I'm the GM for Stashaway for the MENA region. Um, <clears throat> we're a, essentially a digital wealth manager, or the more common term is a robo-advisor. Um, but what does that mean? It means we take a digital, digital based, uh, digital first, uh, sorry, a digital based risk uh, first approach to managing people's investments. Um, we launched in Dubai uh, or in DIT actually 
uh, in late 2020. Uh, but we were operational and we we're originally a Singapore based entity operational over there for the last six years. And now we're present in five markets, manage over a billion uh, dollars in AUM. So obviously still kind of small in the grand scheme of the, the global finance, but uh, starting to become reason, but reasonably well sized um, uh, given, the, 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 given that we've only been operational for the past few years. My background is a little bit more mixed, I guess, than, uh, than our, uh, our, our fellow guests. I started off in finance, working in private equity for about four years. All, all of my, my career has been predominantly been in the region. Um, post MBA, I then got into management consulting uh, and then got into the tech world, joining Kareem, the ride hailing company, um, doing uh, focusing on strategy and then moving into the commercial side of the business before getting back into finance um, with Stashway to launch uh, and then lead our uh, Armina operations. Thanks, Ramzi. Um, and okay, so so let's just get started with uh, straight to the point. Let's just answer the title of of that webinar today. So investing and personal finance for women. Uh, and just before uh, asking the question, which is uh, maybe I'll ask the question and then I'll just give a stat about about that specific top topic. So should you think about personal finance differently for women versus men? Uh, and just out of uh, a statistic that uh, the UB has, a UBS report uh, published a couple of years ago. I'm just, I'm just reading the stat. So nearly half of women defer the financial decision to their spouses. And I'm talking here about 50% of them, right? Among the, the other half, around 35% uh, rather participate in the long-term decision-making equally. So both, both of them. And only 16% of the women take the lead themselves. So there is quite a big gap in terms of the financial decision taken within the household. And so this is for the, the uh, uh, that's a global data, but however, the millennials and the young generation are not really helping that, that data as much because the same report says that more than half, around 54% specifically of the millennials let, uh, let their spouse also take uh, the long-term decision themselves. So according to all of you, uh, maybe we can start uh, with you, Deborah. So should we consider or would we think about personal finance differently for women versus men? It's an interesting question. And I was going to refer to a recent study that BMI Mellon did where they found some impediments to women investing. So one of the challenges they found, and there's three, is that women think they need to have a much higher level of disposable income to be able to even think about investing. So many um, would think that they need to earn at least 50,000. In the US, the number is 70. Another challenge is the view of investing is seen as something that's highly risky. And so that's a second challenge. And then the third is they feel that investment products don't really offer the benefits that they would like to see in something that they would be investing in. If these three challenges were removed, BNY Mellon thinks that $3 trillion could go into global investments by women, and $1.8 trillion of that would be going into um, sustainable or ESG-focused investing. So I do think that there are issues because clearly if we have these roadblocks or impediments, um, that's a big challenge. And I think having worked in the financial industry for quite some time, quite often you divide up in your household who's going to be responsible for what tasks. And it more typically is the man who runs the finances. Um, and I think there's also cultural differences in certain places. It's more typical that the man would run it. And more often the people you talk to within finance are men which in certain geographies make it difficult for women to even have those conversations. Thank you. Uh, what about you, Felicity, with, with your conversation that you're, that you're having with entrepreneurs, uh, with women also leaders in the industry that you've interviewed, uh, do you think that we should differentiate uh, investing in personal finance uh, from, from end to end? I agree. Definitely with what Deborah has said. I mean, there are, you know, lots of challenges for women to, to start investing. But on the flip side, I think as well that, you know, that there's quite a lot of research that has shown that women are considered to be more successful investors compared with men. Um, and that's, you know, because they are more risk averse, whereas, you know, their male counterparts, you know, 
always, you know, tend to take more risks, um, you know, sort of based on emotions and and things like that. But I think as well, um, you know, they, they do have these challenges. Um, and they also, you know, they're also traditionally seen women as, you know, sort of having to leave their careers, for example, for a certain amount of time, perhaps, you know, to raise children or, you know, care for loved ones. And, and I think that that can be a challenge for women as well, you know, not having an income to begin investing and, you know, kind of setting up future financial goals and things like that. Um, and another issue, you know, I mean, why I think it's so important that women should be investing is they do tend to, on average, live longer, a lot longer than men. Um, I'm sorry to say that. Um, and then there's also that wage gap, you know, um, that has led to, um, you know, gender wealth inequality, not only, you know, to do with salaries, but also with long-term financial planning. Um, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, Financial planning, you know, investing is important for both men and women, whether or not you're doing it as a couple or as a single person, single mother like myself, um, you know, and I think, you know, there are some women as well, you know, they're, they're worried about not knowing enough, um, you know, in terms of investing. And that's where, you know, financial literacy skills come in. You know, I always think that, you know, knowledge is power. Um, and, you know, once you have that knowledge, it's very easy to take your first steps. Thank you. Um, maybe let's take an opinion of, uh, of the male uh, speaker on, on the panel today. So, Ramsey, what's, uh, what's your thought on, on that? No, so, I mean, I agree definitely with Deborah and Felicity. So but both, of, both of you kind of hit it right on the head. So there are unique challenges to women. Um, and women view investing also quite differently, right? So Felicity, you said it. So they tend to be more risk averse. They tend to stick to their investment plans in, uh, uh, for the long term. They tend to make less emotional decisions um, compared to their male counterparts. At least that's, that's what the data of, of Stashway uh, tells us. But I think, that, Felicity, you also mentioned something kind of which is quite important. So it's the education and the understanding around it. And that's not a gender problem. That's a, I, that's, that's a global problem. So you never really learn it in school, uh, personal finance. You never really learn about personal finance in university. Um, you, don't, you don't really discuss it in, in MBA. I mean, you talk about finance, but from a business perspective, right? And so where do you learn it from? You learn it from your parents, from your friends, from colleagues. Um, if you're fortunate enough to be in the finance industry, you, you kind of pick up a lot over there. But a lot of that advice and uh, the, the learning that you make is not necessarily uh, correct and doesn't kind of make sense for you. So you say, oh, my friend uh, or, or someone I know invested in this stock, so I should buy it. They bought this crypto country, so I should get it. And so that's not necessarily the right approach for you because your situation is different. Your income levels are different. Your um, risk tolerances are different. And so there is a fundamental issue with education and getting the basics right, so whether it's financial planning, having kind of just understanding your financial situation today, uh, the, the risk and reward relationship in investing, um, and then how to actually go about doing it, because it is, it can be quite intimidating, because there's so much stuff out there. Um, and then you, a lot of people tend to take the, oh, I don't know, so I'll just sit on my cash because it's safer, which is actually worse, worse off for you in the long run. Um, so, I, so I, I think I, I agree that women maybe have kind of faced a, a bit more challenges um, in, in this or more unique challenges um, in this space, but we have uh, the core issue of education, which uh, I think applies to everybody. Thanks, Kamzi. Uh, and, you know, just coming back to the disclaimer then that I mentioned in the beginning between the men and women should not be, you know, differentiated in terms of financial, uh, about investing in, in personal finance. And it's true, it should not be at all differentiated. Investing is similar for both men and women. However, there is a huge, there is a clear gap there and the stats do tell us. Um, and this is why we are having those sessions. And this is why we need to raise awareness and, and talk about it uh, to, to empower women to, to take more initiatives in, 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 into, into taking more uh, lead in, uh, in financial decisions. But at the same time, in order for them to take more initiatives, 
more opportunities should also be given uh, to women and equal opportunities should be given to women uh, in order to, to close and uh, to close that gap. And actually in Stash, we also a few stats that I would like to share with you. When we first launched in 2017, um, the signups and the investor that we got at the beginning, more than 70% out of those signups and investors were only men. Today, that percentage is an equal 50-50. So we are clearly seeing the gap in the on in on the investment front being closed at least from the from the on the stashway app and this has this was led purely from those webinars those talks that we're talking about uh uh you know the awareness that stashway is keep on uh, uh keep on providing uh from before the pandemic during the pandemic and and just after the pandemic right um just want to follow up that discussion with uh with a question about the importance of talking and having a conversation with your partner about financial planning. How important is to a regular checkup, uh, a, a conversation, you know, having both the kind of income merged together. So what is the importance of having that discussion with your partner? Maybe I can start with you, uh, Ramzi. Yeah, so it's it's definitely it's extremely important, right? So if you're entering into uh, whatever type of partnership that is, um, and in terms of re- from a relationship perspective, um, you need to be on the same page of a lot of things. So you discuss family, you discuss uh, children, you discuss religion, you discuss so many things, and finance is one of those very important topics, right? So if you're uh, a prolific saver or if you're a prolific spender. Um, it's just different habits. And so you just need to be aligned on what your just as basic as what your objectives are. Where do you want to be financially? What do you want to achieve? What do you want to leave behind? Um, whatever it is. And it's important to not just have that discussion and be aligned, but also both play an active role in that. Because so Felicity, you mentioned that. So women tend to outlive men. Um, the, also, the sad reality is that divorce rates are also on uh, or on and have been on the rise as well. So in any whoever whoever that spouse is that's or that partner is that's taking that lead role, whenever if, if that if you if it does come to that, uh, hopefully it doesn't, um, you both need to be kind of fully aware, know what's going on, be able to have the confidence to continue to 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 achieve and to work towards your plan, even though that plan may change. Um, so for me, it's extremely important for you for you to both be aligned. Um, and the more you have these kind of tougher conversations up front, then I think the higher likelihood you have of uh, maintaining that longer uh, longer relationship. Obviously, it's not the only thing, but uh, it is it can be an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, Felicity, any um, any comments on uh, on what Ramsey said? Absolutely. Um, look, I mean, I I'm a strong believer in you know, couples being on the same page financially, it's so important. And, you know, not just, I think that there are other reasons as well, you know, I mean, it's not just about setting financial goals, like buying a house or saving for, you know, other important milestones. But, you know, there, there are quite a lot of circumstances and I and I hear about these sorts of stories all the time. You know, um, women, a wife will have an absolutely no understanding um, of, you know, where the family's finances are at, what they've invested in, what are the passwords, you know, kind of all of this. And then suddenly their husband passes away and then they're left in, you know, this nightmare world of, you know, trying to understand everything, you know, that in, the, in the, you know, from the fi- financial perspective and, and it's quite scary for them. Um, so I think, you know, monthly, weekly checkups, you know, anything, you know, just so you're both on the same page is really important. And um, also I would like to say that, I mean, we report on, you know, write about lots of different topics in terms of personal finances. But one one issue that has come up quite a few times is financial infidelity. Um, you know, I, I get readers' letters um, about this or, you know, that we're sort of, it's a topic that, that will also explore, you know, interviewing case studies. And financial infidelity um, is also quite devastating. I mean, if your partner is hiding, you know, I don't know, uh, really high spending habits, you know, they could be secretly putting things on credit cards, racking up masses of debt, 
and, you know, you wake up one day and suddenly, you know, you've got debt collectors knocking on the door. <clears throat> I just think that, you know, everybody being on the same page is important for a whole lot of reasons. Thanks, Felicity and Deborah. Any last comment on, on that topic? Yeah, maybe just going back to something Ramsey said, you know, if you look at the historic model of people engaging with financial advisors, often the financial advisor only spoke to the man in the house. Um, and so I think as advisors and even robos, right, you need to have the relationship with both of the partners and you also need to have the relationship with the children, whether it's a boy or a girl, because there is this large transfer of wealth that's happening. And it's unusual. I think the only place where I now just have seen the state of Florida is instituting financial uh, literacy programs into the school system, which just happened this week, um, but it is highly unusual. So I think the big challenge is it is unusual for people to have those conversations and it's almost seen as inappropriate, right? You don't really see any culture where it would be okay for me to talk to Felicity about how much money I earn it's and especially if you're in the same business, right? So you don't talk about that because it's seen as kind of bragging. Um, you don't talk about in general your overall investments. You might say, hey, I just invested in the stock because I think it's interesting and kind of bragging about it. But I think we do need a better systematic way of educating people at a younger age, whether it's a boy or a girl. And I do think one of the things that I've talked about for a long time is the robo-advisors have jumped in to fill a really important role because if you look at the U.S., every day 10,000 people turn 65 years old. And most of these people are not in the financial industry. So they're not really sure how they should be thinking about investing. And being able to go onto a robo-advisor site and play around with different investments, play around with fees, asset allocation, and be able to become informed enough to actually have a conversation with someone about investing going forward is one of the most important roles I think robos have played and don't get credit for that because a lot of the robos don't allow you to talk to someone. And so I think as we've seen this hybrid approach where when it's important and you wanna to talk to someone, the ability to do that, I think is something that's really important. I think once people make those big decisions, then incrementally they continue to invest and are happy to do it. So I think robos have played a very important role in allowing various types of people to become educated enough to have conversations. Otherwise they're embarrassed. They don't even know what to ask. Thanks a lot for opening that uh, the topic, Deborah. And, you know, especially as a robot advisor ourselves, uh, we have, as Ramzi just said, uh, we offer a digital first approach in terms of your investment, but there's always someone behind the phone, behind the screen to talk to you and, and to guide you. And through those webinars and through the Stashway Academy, we try as much as possible raising uh, awareness uh, about financial literacy and financial knowledge. Uh, and just staying on the topic uh, of Stashaway and what we do, um, and talking a bit more about uh, investing in particular, we uh, only invest in ETFs. Um, that's the only uh, instrument that we use in terms of, uh, of our uh, of, to construct our portfolio. And you, Deborah, you've been um, uh, an expert uh, over the years in, in that specific um, uh, instrument and, and that industry. So according to you, what are the trends that you're seeing uh, in terms of ETF investing and specifically for women? Uh, have the pandemic really increased uh, uh, awareness about that specific instrument for women to, to invest in? Well, you know, it is interesting. And I would say in general, yes, um, but it's, you get better data from the US, but I do think one of the things I saw, so actually I flew back from an event in New York on March 11, 2020 and landed back in London where I live. And, you know, the next day I had my computer open. I had my iPad looking at CNBC and what's going on. And it is quite impressive that everything CNBC talks about in terms of sectors and countries, they're using ETFs and their tickers to talk about it. Uh, we also saw that the same year, the fees on trading went away. So investors in the US can buy or sell securities and ETFs without paying commission. So that was a big change. And Charles Schwab did a study where they found that 15% of investors in the stock market in 2021 were, sorry, in 2020 were new investors. And these investors were more positive, more inclined to make decisions on their own, 
um, and we're using ETFs more. Not that ETFs are the only product out there, but what I would say is what I've liked about ETFs is they're a very democratic investment product. So having worked with institutions when I was at Morgan Stanley, you would find that pension funds and hedge funds would get access to investment products with low fees. Retail investors would get access to products with higher fees. And the toolbox for retail was very small, what you could do. And the toolbox for institutions was very big. ETFs are really the only product out there where everyone gets access to the same type of investment at the same annual cost, with in most cases, the minimum size being just one share. So many ETFs, you could buy a share for less than 100 US dollars. Um, and in some cases, you could buy multiple shares. So what we've seen is ETFs have allowed investors, retail, to get access to the same products. I'm not saying all ETFs that exist make sense for everyone, because what you really should be thinking about is, what are my investment goals? Am I looking to save money to invest in a house? Am I looking to put my children through university? Am I looking towards retirement? Um, but basically, what we have seen is ETFs that provide exposure to broad benchmarks are still the biggest. So many investors will invest in the US market and buy exposure to the S&P 500. And so you can do that with an annual cost of less than 10 basis points. So when you think about 10 basis points, 1% is 100 basis points. So a very tiny annual cost. And one of the studies that's out there is investing in lower cost products over the long run will deliver better returns for most people. And it's also difficult to find active mutual funds or active products that beat their benchmark. So if you were to look at the S&P 500 as an example in the US, typically seven out of 10 active funds do not beat the S&P 500 on a one, three or five year basis. And the ability to do it consistently is very low. So for most investors, you are better off using index products like ETFs at a lower cost and getting your return or alpha through asset allocation. So maybe you're better at deciding right now, maybe it's a good time not to be putting money to work in Europe, but go to the US and maybe go to Japan. But you can get an advisor or like you said, your robo can help people understand how much money to put in equities, how much to put in fixed income, how much to put in gold. Um, and you wanna think about that asset allocation. The more typical trends we see going forward also is COVID has raised awareness of the impact of everything we're doing on the environment, on social and government, and that shorthand is called ESG. And we've seen many investors that want to invest in things that are good for the planet. So you might think of solar, you might think of water shortages, you might think of products that are embracing and enhancing diversity. So many investors, both sovereign wealth funds, advisors, and, and retail are investing in these types of products, or others would say, you know what, I really see that longer term, I think products that are helping to build electronic vehicles are going to do better. So thematic ETFs have also proved to be very popular recently. So many people can relate to this. And often it's hard to figure out which products will be leading in some of these disruptive technologies. Maybe I'll stop there. A lot to say. And thanks, Deborah. And, and maybe Ramsey, you can touch upon why uh, we use internally ETFs um, and, and stash away to complement what, what Deborah said in terms of the trends. Yeah, so it echoes a lot of what Deborah said. Um, another kind of great way, great thing that it adds is uh, uh, it's an easy way, it's easy and cost effective way to get diversification. Uh, and so just buying one ETF doesn't necessarily mean you're fully diversified, uh, but it does add to that. So instead of buying 100 or 1,000 different stocks across different industries and different geographies, you can get the same diversification. So you can get an optimum uh, portfolio or an efficient portfolio that maximizes the potential return at that specific risk level by holding as little as, let's say, five to 10 uh, different ETFs. And ETFs include everything now, right? So it's equities, bonds, real estate, commodities, um, different themes, different sectors, different geographies. So it's, it's kind of all encompassing. Uh, but I think just one thing to note is that not all ETFs are created equal. Uh, and so you do need to do your diligence before you buy into an ETF, even though it may sound great and check kind of all your boxes, at least at a high level. 
but you want to make sure. So what, what we only invest in kind of like plain vanilla uh, ETFs uh, as they're called, or as the kind of colloquial term is. Um, and so what does that mean? That means that it's, there's no leverage. It's not shorted. There's no kind of beta. beta there's no kind of, uh, there's no uh, uh, other action or uh, active part of the portfolio manager that gives them discretion to do um, kind of different things. Uh, and then you also want to make sure that it has obviously enough volume. The liquidity is there. If you do want to buy or sell, you're buying it uh, at or very close to kind of the spot rate. So you're not uh, uh, paying too high in fees. You want to make sure the expense ratios make sense, uh, the tracking error. So there's a lot of that that comes into play. And so the reputation of the fund manager, its ability to kind of stay out there, uh, what indices or what, uh, wh where is it kind of traded? Um, so I don't want to kind of, I don't want to intimidate the audience, um, but there is more to it than that, than just kind of buying it or, or finding the one ETF that, that you like. Uh, but it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be very complicated. If you have that kind of like short list of criteria, it's usually quite straightforward to, to see uh, if it fits that. Uh, and that's that's some of the stuff that, that we do look at, right? So our universe of ETFs is only like 35 or so, uh, plus or minus, uh, that we use to create our different portfolios that are all fully diversified. And each one is a combination of seven to 12 uh, different ETFs for us uh, on average. Uh, and like I said, it includes uh, all geographies and all, uh, all uh, asset classes, so bonds, equities, uh, real estate, commodities, et cetera. Um, so I'll just mention that. And then there's a lot of new exciting stuff also happening within the crypto space, but that also you need to be careful, right? So when you're buying an ETF in crypto on Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever it is, uh, you're not buying into a fund that buys and holds that that asset directly. So that's another thing that you need to be careful of. So today or or so far, at least, uh, it, might, uh, it might have changed because that space moves very quickly. Um, is you're buying into a fund that buys futures or options um, within that space that also has kind of a time lag. And so it's not necessarily tracking the price movements fully accurately, or it has some sort of lag to it. So um, it's, but it's an exciting space. It's given so much opportunity and so much, uh, so much more options for people to invest in and invest in the things that they like and the things that they believe in. Uh, and so if crypto, for example, is something that's, intimidating or it's it's not straightforward how to open an account on a crypto exchange or anything like that and you don't you don't you don't want to go through that uh, you can use your existing broker and just buy one of those ETFs it just makes things a lot easier and gives a lot more access um, so there's a lot of benefits to it um, I don't want to sound like I'm endorsing crypto ETFs but it was just kind of like one of the examples that uh, I was just reading about this week thanks thanks Ramzi uh, I want to jump to you Felicity uh, you as a personal finance editor, um, we we participated uh, in, in, in quite a few articles. We we read we read a lot of your articles as well. Uh, we listened to your podcast. So, out of all of this that, that you're trying to do, what is it that you're trying to achieve uh, out of the the articles that you're writing, the awareness that you're spreading at the same time, uh, and through and through the podcast as well? I think I mean the most important thing is to help people understand and learn about personal finance give them the knowledge you know that I, I always believe that knowledge is power um, and I think you know here in the UAE um, the personal finance space has changed quite a lot since I was uh, you know since I first started out here as a personal finance editor um, 12 13 years ago now um, those were the days you know when you would and I'm sure that you've heard these stories, you know, those really high commission financial salesmen, you know, they'd go, pay, you know, cold calling uh, people, selling them, you know, uh, exorbitantly high um, investment products that, you know, where <clears throat> most of the money went to, you know, in, in commissions, you know, you weren't making anything from them really, you know, for long periods of time, 20 years, whatever. And I think now, you know, I mean, okay. sorry. It still happens, by the way. Sorry, I didn't mean to it interrupt. Does. It, it does. It does, yeah. There, so but I think people are so much more aware of, you know, those those types of products. And I think, you know, one one thing that we try to, to do is, you know, show people, you know, you have options here. You've got ETFs, for example. They're low cost. Um, you know, we've got, uh, you know, digital wealth advisors who are democratizing investing, making it, you know, very easy for people to, 
to invest and to learn about, you know, what they need to do to set up really good, um, you know, future financial plans and whatever. So, I mean, from for our from our perspective, you know, we we write, you know, about investing. I mean, tomorrow's uh, our lead feature tomorrow, for example, is about ESG, um, you know, and how it's really driving investments at the moment. Um, and it, you know, it explains it a bit, it, you know, but it, it also appeals to, you know, sort of people with a little more sophisticated knowledge of investing, but also it helps to educate people who don't, um, you know, have that same level of knowledge as well. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, it is to um, help people understand just how positive it is, you know, and, and sorry, the positive difference that it makes to your life to have this, you know, to, to have a, a solid financial plan um, for the future, you know, not just for today, but, you know, even when you retire and teaching your kids about it as well. You know, um, we, we interview a lot of kids about, you know, their trading experiences um, as well. You know, they're kind of everywhere these days. And I think, you know, the meme stocks and, and GameStop and, you know, Reddit um, has really helped to drive, you know, teenagers into this space. But, you know, there is a lot of false information out there as well, you know, and they, they're all using social media for their information. So that's another thing that we're also trying to, to help with as well. Thanks, Felicity. Um, and, and just want to take your, both of your advice as two uh, women leaders in, in each of your, of your industry. What would you say is your top three tips for managing your, your personal finances as, as a woman? I will start with you, Deborah. Well, I think Felicity actually alluded to it is you need to create a budget and think about what are your expenses and when are they coming due and make sure that you're saving for those things and living within your means. Um, and if you do have, you know, goals that you put money aside and maybe have different pots of savings for if I want to go on holiday, I put some money into that little pot and keep it aside. Um, I think if you're in a relationship, then you want to make sure that you're having a conversation and you have kind of a set of funds that's there to pay the bills that have to be paid. I think you have another set of um, money set aside that can be used. And I do think everyone should have their own kind of little pot of money that they can use for fun things. You shouldn't have to ask permission to buy yourself an ice cream cone or something, right? I mean, just there should be an amount of money that isn't questionable if you want to spend it and you should have that freedom to do so. Um, but yeah, and I think you, you need to find places you can go to to get advice and understand things. And, you know, I think Ramsey raised a really good point that, um, you know, there are ETFs that sound totally the same, but can be very different. And so you do need to do your homework and make sure you understand the products you're investing in. Um, I think one of the things about ETFs that's quite useful is you actually can look at an ETF and see what stocks or bonds it holds, which for many people, if they want to understand what does it mean to be investing in solar, or, you know, autonomous cars or ESG, they can actually look inside of it. So I think it's asking questions and feeling comfortable and don't feel pressured and don't assume, right? Because when you assume there's that US saying, right, you uh, don't do well for yourself or anyone else. And uh don't be afraid to ask questions. I think that's how you learn, right? So you're better off asking and learning than doing something and making a mistake. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Deborah. What about your Felicity? Any, uh, any tips you'd like to add on what Deborah mentioned? I totally agree with what Deborah said. Um, I think it's really important not to be afraid to ask questions. Um, setting a budget, all those sorts of things are really important, but also having an emergency fund um, you know, six to eight months worth of expenses is really good, you know, just to shield you, or protect you from, you know, financial surprises that may pop up. It could be, I don't know, major car repairs. It could be, you know, a medical emergency or something like that. Um, I would also say stay away from bad debt, you know, pay off your credit cards every month. Don't let compounding interest add on to onto that debt um, and also you know if if you are taking that those first steps into 
investing. Um, just, you know, as I keep saying, knowledge is power. You, there are lots of uh, platforms now, stash away, um, social media. There are some, you know, very good uh, people giving out tips on social media, but, you know, just don't fall for the ones that are selling things for their own benefit. Um, and also, you know, when you start investing, um, don't don't be stressed if, you know, suddenly the market falls um, because, you know, the market always goes back up, right? It, it, um, history proves that. Um, but, you know, so, so don't let emotional emotions overtake, um, you know, your investment decisions. Uh, Ramsey, any kind of advice from your side coming from Stashway? Yeah, so the way, so how I, so I'm maybe I, I, I didn't share this at the beginning, but I'm, so I'm a husband and I'm a father of two daughters also. So obviously this topic is extremely important uh, for me in general. I, my, I mean, my children are still a little bit young, but um, for me, the most, most important thing is kind of first um, have that conversation, be aligned, get kind of get, get comfortable with, with the topic and discuss it with each other. And even with your children, similar to what you, Deborah, were saying, was saying earlier. Um, and then number most important thing is pay down any high interest debt that you have. Don't get into the trap of compounding of compounded interest that works against you. Uh, get your emergency fund in place because that's extremely important. So whether it's a car repair or medical, but also you want to protect yourself in case of job loss or loss of income or stuff, which, which happened to a lot of people uh, during COVID and is not kind of, uh, it's not really foreign or far anymore for a lot of people. Uh, and then the third thing after that is just kind of get your plan in place and start saving and investing uh, towards that, towards that or those goals. And the most important thing really is just to start. So you're going to make mistakes. That's fine. You need, as long as you're learning from them, uh, like Felicia said, markets go down, markets go up. Um, they're going to go down uh, probably at least five to 10 times before you, before, you, you know, in the next like 20 years, if not more than that. Um, but they, they will recover and uh, you just need to kind of keep up with that and not be intimidated, not be afraid. Um, and just kind of, uh, even if you're not saving as much as you want or investing as much as you want towards achieving those goals or paying down your debt or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. The most important thing is just to start. And then you can look at your budget. You can look at your alternate sources of income. You look at your primary source of income and you figure out uh, slowly how to figure how to, how to get the pieces to fit together in the way that makes the most sense for you because each person's situation, that's why it's called personal finance. Each person's personal situation is really personal and unique to them. Uh, but you're the one who needs to take charge. You're the one who needs to take control and you just need to kind of put one foot forward and, uh, and start that journey, uh, whether it's alone or with your partner. You know, can I add something there? Cause one mm -hmm. idea that I've done in the past, um, is, you know, if you buy for a child an ETF and you say to them, you can have conversations about what's inside of it, right? So let's pretend you buy an emerging market ETF. So you can go through all the different companies that are in there. You can talk about investing in, you know, what's it like to invest in China versus investing in Brazil. You can talk about the companies and what they do, about the management, you can look at the prices. Well, I don't even know any longer about newspapers. I don't really buy newspapers any longer, but to the extent you used to be able to look in the newspaper and see the prices of the underlying shares. But I think it's a fun way to have a conversation about, you know, companies, what drives performance of companies, how that all gets wrapped up into an ETF. And the fact that ETFs are pretty easy to buy, like something that is diversified, as Ramsey said, and have that fun kind of conversation with your children or nieces, nephews, whatever, is I think a useful way to get them exposed at an early age to looking at financial returns, looking at companies, looking at countries. It's kind of like having a interesting conversation to have at dinner that's not about something that's, uh, I don't know, stressful. Thanks. Um, and if, if you guys don't mind, I would like to also participate in the, in the uh, list of tips. And you guys mentioned the, um, the budget and actually in Stash Away, we kind of promote a way, an easy way for you to, to start budgeting. And if you don't know how to start and where to start, consider that rule of thumb um, when, when starting. Use the 50, 30, 20 rule. 50% uh, of, your, of your monthly income, you'd say, should go into essentials, like your rent 
like your loan, if you have any loans paying off your, your, your debt, uh, grocery, food, transportation, any, any of the sort. 30% should go into something to like to spend on yourself, like the cone of ice cream that you mentioned, Deborah, or if you want to go travel, if you want to go shopping, um, if you want to go out and have some, some drinks with, with, with your friends, that should go there. And 20% would go then into your savings, into your investment, try to create an emergency fund first, and then you can you know, start investing towards, towards your goals. And the second tip I would say, try to prioritize retirement before anything else, um, even though if you are at, a, at an early stage of your career or in, uh, in, the, in your 30s or uh, in, your, in your 40s, retirement is never something to not consider, even though if it's in the next 20, 30 years, it's the most expensive thing that you will be saving for. And it is something that you need, the, the capital that you are saving now, you definitely need it to, uh, during retirement. And all the, all the types of end of service benefit and the pension plans that we have are not sufficient for a regular person to sustain the similar lifestyle that they're having while, um, while, while working. So that's very important. Maybe to sum up or to wrap up the session today, just a final question and maybe uh, on the entrepreneurial side of, of women. And according to the IMF, I'm also reading out of stat from, from a report that was issued in 2019. In the MENA region specifically, only 14% of the SMEs are led by women compared to 34% globally. So according to you, uh, and I appreciate that you uh, both of you are are, are not um, Arab, but also you. I'm pretty sure uh, oh, that you, uh, you you are a uh, member of the uh, Women ETF in the MENA region, if I'm not mistaken. And Felicity, you work quite some time here in, in in the region. So, according to you, what should women do to take more initiatives in creating maybe their own businesses in the MENA region? Have the region itself given enough opportunities for women to take that step? Maybe we can start with you, Felicity. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, th there's been a lot of positive change for women uh, in the region over the you know past few years. And we are seeing more female entrepreneurs sitting up and there are, you know, uh, there is quite, quite a lot of good support here. Um, you know, and and as I'm as I'm sure that you know, the UAE, one of its aims, you know, is to you know have a really um, you know dynamic startup scene here, and they're investing a lot of money in that. Um, you know, there's a lot of incubator programs. Women are joining those with their startups. So, you know, what more can we do? I mean, you know, I think I think uh, you know women here. They're already they're already doing that, you know. They're already doing all the right things, but I think it's just, you know, what do you need to take that step to launch your startup? What more can be done? Um, you know, is it, I don't know, a fear of failing that's that's um, preventing you from doing that? How can we give you more courage um, or more, you know, sort of more finance, you know, to 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 uh, take your your idea, you know, to that first stage. Thanks. What about you, Deborah? What do you think about that topic? You created yeah, your company saying, as well, right? So you're an entrepreneur yourself. Yes. Um, but I think in general, it goes back to women being in general more risk adverse, right? So often, like if a woman is asked to, you know, consider putting herself forward for a new role, she wants to know that she can do 100% of that role before she puts her hand up where typically, right, there's studies that would say men are more likely to put their hand up even if they think they can only do like 50% of the role. So I think women need to surround themselves with a support network that helps to inspire them and give them confidence and lets them talk about challenges in a safe environment, right? Because you have to be careful when you're trying to start something, you need to look strong to the outside world, right? You can't be uncertain yourself because you're never going to get off the ground. So I think developing that safe network of friends and associates, and then there does have to be that support system where you can go for funding and other things you need, right? So, but part of it is you just need that support network yourself, and then to be in an environment where you can find the funding and other networking supplies, et cetera, that you need. So I do think it is more challenging for women, but I guess maybe for me, I grew up as a tomboy and uh, I always felt if a guy can do it, I can do it. And uh, <laughs> 
willing to take the risk. Thanks, Deborah. And uh, final comments from you, Renzi, on, on this topic. Well, what's your what's your take? So, I'm not an entrepreneur per se. So, my I guess the way I'm getting into this is by joining uh, uh, the startup or startup ish um, kind of world. What I would say is it's obviously it's it depends on each individual, right? So there's no kind of one if it's not you should or should not do it. It very much depends on you and what you're comfortable with and what your ambitions are. Um, but uh, you do need to have kind of a higher risk appetite, let's say, to to venture out on your own and, and start it. So it's not a small decision. It's not an easy decision. But uh, if done well, of course, it can be hugely rewarding, uh, both uh, professionally and financially, hopefully as well. Um, but do your homework, do your diligence, make sure you stand on kind of strong financial footing. And it doesn't mean you have, uh, you've already achieved your retirement plan or you have X million dollars in the bank, um, but at least make sure that you're not in kind of a high debt or debt that you can't manage. Uh, you have an emergency fund in place. So at least like the basics, uh, financially speaking, to be there or have uh, that conversation then with your partner uh, who, so that you can you can support each other and be aligned with each other on what type of commitment that means, whether it's your personal time, how are you splitting the other tasks, what does it mean financially? Um, so I think it's I'm talking maybe a little bit more about kind of like the planning side of things of of getting into that. Uh, but if you do have a strong conviction, if you do have an idea that you believe in, um, then go out and do it. It's never too late. Um, I don't remember the exact. I know it's not a woman, but I don't remember the exact age of uh, when. I think it was like 61 or something when uh, Colonel Sanders started KFC. Um, so it's, it's uh, the, the point of that is just, it's, it's, even if you think it's too late, it's never really too late. Thanks, Ramzi. And I think you, you summed up quite well our entire conversation today uh, in those words. So actually this concludes our, um, our, our session for today. So I want to, I want to thank all three of you for, for attending and giving your uh, very important input uh, on, on that specific topic. I don't see any questions from the audience, uh, but if they are later on, I would make sure to send them uh, across to you to, to get your answers. The, the, ses the, the session is also live on Facebook. We'll be posting it on YouTube as well. So a lot of viewers were also gonna see them there. Comments will be dropped later on. So we'll make sure to pass on the question to you guys. Um, anything you would like to add before, um, before ending the session? Thank you for being a good host, Joseph. I yes. try. No. <laughs> Thank you. We want to come visit the region again. So hopefully uh, I get to see you guys in person at some point. Thank you. Absolutely. That'd be great. We'll, we'll love to be in the city when we're in Abu Dhabi. We'll see you as well. Yes, that would be great. I, I joined a panel that you uh, were doing yesterday at the um, Arab Household Savings Conference. Oh, great. Well. Thank you. Yes. Quoted you in the story. So all good. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Cool. Thanks, Missy. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks a lot, Ramsey, uh, for attending. Thanks for all the viewers also who tuned in for, for today's session. And I uh, hope to see you next time. Stay invested. Thank you Thank very you. much. Cheers. Bye.